This is the uh, second frog-related sh- program this week. Hashtag frog-related. If you missed my interview with Dr. Kerry Krieger from uh, Save the Frogs this, this past week, where have you been? Uh, no worries, though. You can uh, find that interview on my YouTube channel. Great talk on his work on uh, amphibian conservation. We had an amphibian conservation conversation. Uh, today's different, though. Those of you at social media who enjoy keeping frogs may have heard of Mike Matson, my guest today. He's the owner of Mike's Fat Frogs, and he's been breeding frogs like crazy lately by the thousands. I had a chat with him, uh, which I'll share with you in just a minute. But uh, let's do some quick shout-outs first. Save the Frogs Day is coming up, April 29th. If you believe in frog conservation and want to organize an event for this annual worldwide effort, uh, go to savethefrogs.com, find more information. You can uh, organize something at a school or online. Uh, You can get pretty creative with it. Uh, You can even organize a frog march if you want. Lots of uh, marches going on lately. You might as well march for frogs. And you don't got to wear a pink hat. You can wear a green one, though. Also, American Frog Day is held each year in uh, Fremont, California. Fun all-amphibian show with the vendors. Uh, it's lots of fun. Last year, I got some frogs and a t-shirt. Uh, so watch for that show coming up. American Frog Day this spring. I think it's usually in April or May. Uh, but for more info, you can go to AmericanFrogDay.com. Watch for updates on that and see when it's happening. Also, also, the Reptile Breeder Show is happening in Lodi, California. Great show that's been going on these past few years. It's a fun one. April 15th and 16th at the Lodi Grape Festival Fairgrounds. Website, thereptilebreedershow.com. Lots of breeders getting together, offering the fruits of their labor. Snakes, lizards, tortoises, tarantulas, frogs, maybe some glow sticks and music. You never know what's going to happen there. The Reptile Breeder Show in Lodi. Of course, if you're in Northern California, you need to check out the Central Valley Herpetological Society. It's a great group for anyone interested in reptile and amphibians. Um, They meet monthly in Manteca, California, the third Saturday every every month. Uh, You can find more info at cvherps.org. Those meetings are fun. If you... uh, haven't done so already, please subscribe to the Edgar Ortega YouTube channel and catch all my interviews as they're uploaded. Uh, Go ahead and open another tab right now. You can go to youtube.com, find Edgar Ortega, one word, find my channel and go ahead and subscribe to that. Um, Be sure to follow the uh, Edgar Ortega Radio Show Facebook page and go there to find out how, uh, how you can enter to win some Rare Communal Tarantulas from KenTheBugGuy.com. we got that contest going on right now. Great sponsor, donating a great prize. Get you some tarantulas. Go to my radio show page on Facebook for details on how to win those. You could enter for free. It's a promotional thing we're doing right now. All right, let's, uh, let's give you what you came here for. My guest today has animal care in his blood. If you follow his Facebook page, you'll see he's always posting uh, photos and videos of his frog breeding activities. Fun to watch. He uh, makes it look really easy. In my interview, we talk about how he uh, got started, animals he's working with, and uh, we get a peek, just a peek into how he goes about breeding so many frogs. Some of the secrets. Um, Towards the end, his signal gets a little wonky, so heads up on that, so you know. He's a busy guy, though, so I was glad that uh, he took time out of his day to talk with me. Uh, so let's go to that now. We're talking to Mike Matson of Mike's Fat Frogs. Enjoy the interview. All right. He is the hardest working guy in the frog business. My guest is Mike Matson. He is the owner of Mike's Fat Frogs. That's uh, P-H-A-T, fat. His website is mikesfatfrogs.weebly.com. If you, can, uh, you can also find him on Facebook and just search for Mike's Fat Frogs. Uh, Mike Madsen, it's uh, great to chat with you here today. Great to chat with you too. Yeah, I was looking forward to it. In uh, my little intro there, I called you the hardest working guy in the frog business. Uh, and that's just an observation from what I see, from the hours it sounds like you keep, um, and the stuff you you post on social media. I mean, you breed frogs like crazy, and you've got other stuff going on too. I see you playing around with birds lately. What's going on with that? 
I just uh, moving into the bird business a little bit. Um, my dad's been doing it for 30 years, and there's a very large generation gap in that. It seems that the majority of the bird breeders are 40 years old and up, and there's no one younger taking that over. So there's going to be a, a big opening spot for a few people to uh, create a very large business in that industry, and that's what I'm slowly moving into again. Oh, that's cool. So is that in addition to the amphibians you're breeding? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Mike's Fat Feathered Creatures oh, is what it's called. Keeping the, so, theme, keeping the fat theme going. Um, yeah, yeah, keeping the fat theme going. Yeah, I see uh, you posting pictures with toucans, and what, what kind of birds you have? They're really interesting. Uh, I've got quite a few. There's uh, toucans, taracos, hornbills, a couple different types of uh, exotic pigeons from Africa, uh, lots of finches from South America and Africa. Uh, let's see what else is there. Um, I have geese coming in from Africa in April, uh, bearded barbets, all, all types of stuff. You all got, types of stuff. You got geese coming in. Yeah, they're uh, African pygmy geese. They're, they're really rare here in the U.S., and they're very seldom seen. Most of the time they'll be at zoos or the private individuals that have the you know larger breeding collection of rare rare birds they'll have them also but there's very few of them here in the u.s oh wow that's really interesting um i saw something with these birds where are you based out of uh based out of uh hesperia and then i have a small spot there in laughlin nevada also okay um now going on to uh your main thing the frogs i know i was excited to talk to you about this today um mm -hmm. well you were just actually keep it on the bird you're just at a show recently in san jose how'd that go yeah uh, i went pretty good it's a uh... It's a the, up and growing show. The bird um, show. Yeah, it's it was a bird reptile combo, exotic animals. Um, they're you know they're growing. It's trying to get new vendors into the door and stuff like that. Everybody's usually pretty scared going into a new show. They don't know what the outcome is. Everybody seems to want a guarantee. So <laughs> I don't mind helping out those shows and and vending. They treat you pretty well. Oh, good. That's good that they treated you well there. Um, now let's talk about your animals. Are these animals? Mm -hmm your full-time job or do you have some other means of income uh how's it work uh full-time job now uh before i used to work for a couple different construction companies and a family business that does uh construction back backhoes and stuff like that and there was not enough time in the day to do that and the animals so i had to choose one or the other <laughs> and just take the plunge so you chose to live the dream so to speak <laughs> yeah yep yeah, and now I mentioned how hard you work. Take, take us through a t your typical day. Oh, typical day. Uh, which day do you? <laughs> which day would you like? The uh, day where shipments arrive to customers, or the day before? <laughs> I don't know. Tell tell me all about it. I <laughs> uh, will go with the uh, the day that shipments arrive. Okay. Most of the shipments I do, I send back east, and so everybody starts getting their boxes. You know, between nine and ten a.m. their time which is 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock here. So my phone will start going off about that. Usually I'll get up and uh, start the day, go out to the greenhouse, feed all the birds first, water everybody, uh, go inside, do the reptiles. And right now I'm doing a, a lot of small things too. I have my daughter, I'm setting her up with a rabbit project, something for her to do. Um, so we're building her rabbit hutches and also expanding the birds. So I'm doing that throughout the day. Um, nighttime comes around and go feed birds again, water everybody, uh, pack orders for shipping, and uh, usually just talk to customers and people online till about midnight. Wow, so it's a full day for you. How many hours is that? Uh, I'd say 17 hours, somewhere in there. Most every day? Yeah, mostly every day. Well, yeah, I was mostly like every day. Yeah, it's a good work ethic. Um, a lot of people in the industry, I mean, they work really hard. The bills that are successful, I know mm -hmm. uh, I visited with Bob Clark, and that guy's just always working, never takes a day off. It's it's pretty oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, and others yeah. others that I've met in the reptile industry, I mean, they have that strong work work ethic. You don't just uh, try a little bit, and then if you 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 know if you make a few mistakes, you you quit. Uh, I mean, you keep going. You're always working. Yeah, yeah. You can't walk away from mistakes. It's the only way you can learn. Yeah, you know, I've, had, or, I've had a lot of effort, <laughs> trial yeah. and error in the very beginning. And I couldn't tell you how many uh, five and ten and twenty gallon tanks I've bought just to 
try and race tadpoles in those and it never panned out. <laughs> I've got them. I've got a eight by 24 building here. That's filled with glass tanks that I don't even use anymore. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I want to get to how you, uh, where you keep all these guys at some point here, but, um, um, I do want to talk to you about how you produce all these thi- all these uh, frogs. You're very prolific with the frogs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fun to watch the photos and the videos you share on social media. But uh, right. but well, before we get there, give us the backstory. How did you get into working one with animals? Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned a little bit, but eventually into the frogs you work with now. Well, my dad back in the '90s he used to be an importer, and he did uh, a lot of reptiles back then. And this was uh, 91, 92, 93, when I was two, three, four years old. Um, you know, he'd go to Ghana, Africa. I remember the uh, collector over there, Sonny and Patricia, they actually came here to the States and, you know, would bring the animals with them and, and uh, we'd show them around the, the California area and then they'd fly back home. But he had a store down here in the 90s and that's kind of where it started. Um, and then he transitioned into birds about 98, 99. And he's been doing those more than reptiles. He, he kind of keeps reptiles to the side, um, you know, has a few tanks here and there. But uh, after, uh, let's see, I think it was 11th grade, I started picking up reptiles again. This would be like 2006, 2007. Um, started doing that again. You know, I'd buy from Strictly Reptiles and supply some of the local stores up in my area where I lived. And then uh, after high school, uh, my brother... He didn't really have anything to do at home. He was younger than me, kind of a troublemaker. And so I called up Strictly and I bought him a dozen Pac-Man frogs to, you know, keep and raise and see if he could get them to breed. And he uh, ended up not wanting them after a couple months. And they went over to me and I started reading about them and, uh, you know, heard of this man named Philippe. Yeah. And which, you know, everybody knows who Philippe is. And it you're speaking of Philippe de Vaugelay. Yep. Took me a good uh, year, year and a half to get my first Pac-Man frog spawn. It was on my birthday. Um, I believe it was 2011. And uh, after that, I started, you know, figuring out more and more and watching the, the frog's behavior and figuring out the little key signs to when they are ready to breed. And uh, sent Philippe a couple emails. And, you know, eventually I got some responses from him. And he kind of gave me a a lane to go down and he helped me some and it was a good uh good thing for me you know i wouldn't i wouldn't be here without him without the guidance that i received you know from him several years ago yeah i mean a lot of us uh grew up reading his books his care guides that sort of thing uh, he's done a lot for the industry um i'd love to talk to him someday too um now tell us some of the species you're working with uh, and producing now uh mostly uh Cranwally. The uh, Cranwell's Pac-Man frog. I have some ornates. Those are very difficult to breed for some reason. Mm. Um, I have, let's see, bird poop frogs, yeah. red-eye tree frogs, super tiger legs. Uh, what else do I have? I have Crespidopus. Um, those are pretty neat little tree frogs. Uh, let's see. I cut back quite a bit. I just have a small group of tomato frogs. I'm trying to focus on a small percentage of frogs versus have 30 different types and sporadically produce. Um, and that's kind of where those are going. I slowed down on the frogs a little bit since doing the birds. Um, but once I'm planning on moving to Florida here in the next year, year and a half, once I move there, it'll be a lot easier for me to do a larger variety of frogs. Yeah, yeah. So you're not necessarily cutting back on it forever just to help you while you get your your birds going. Uh, yeah. I saw you were uh, thinking about offering um, tomato frog tadpoles, too. <laughs> yep. Yeah, those are, you know, the tadpoles are something I haven't had that much time to actually raise the frogs themselves. Yeah. You know, from tadpole stage to frog stage is about 30 to 40 days. Depends on, you know, the water temperature and the quality and stuff like that, how much food you give them. Yeah, I saw you're offering um, uh, tadpoles of several species, yeah. Yep. And so the... I, instead of me holding back all of them, raising them into frogs, I thought, you know what? This is easy enough. A majority of people can can do this. And I just said, you know, I'll offer them at a low price, kind of where everybody's able to get a hold of them, where they're all able to try them out. It's something different. Not everybody's going to be able to breed these frogs. And, you know, unfortunately, 
there's a good and bad side to keeping the actual breeding secrets for the Pac-Man frogs mm-hmm. um, to ourselves. The reason being is they produce, you know, a high number of babies. I mean, you're talking 2,000 babies two times a year <laughs> per female. And that, that market would be overcrowded astronomically. Um, so I thought, you know what, let's, let's give everybody a chance just to raise their own from a tadpole. It's the earliest stage that you can get besides the egg. So there's been, gosh, hundreds of people that have bought them over the last year and a half, and they enjoy them. They love them. They love them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And if we get more people uh, raising the tadpoles and then kind of going back to where you started, um, trial mm-hmm. and error and that sort of thing. I'll see how much I can get out of you as far as breeding goes. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. I'm a little so, bit more laxed on it these days. Oh, okay. So hopefully people won't be mad at you by the end of this show. But uh, I want to talk to you about some other things first. Okay. Um, how many frogs and tadpoles do you think uh, you're producing at this time? Uh, out of the uh, couple thousand, I keep back about 1,500 or so to raise into frogs. And then the rest are sold as tadpoles to customers across the U.S. And they raise those guys into frogs. So I'd say about 80 to 90% make it from tadpole to frog. And then you have that small majority that you know natural selection plays out on. Yeah, just you got the sheer numbers just kind of like in nature. Um, there yep. now I wanted to ask you this before we get into the breeding stuff. There's come some concern from amphibian conservation side of it. Um, of course, there's the chytrid fungus mm-hmm. that's causing problems for frog populations worldwide. I mean, this stuff's wiping them out pretty rapidly. Is captive breeding of frogs a good thing or a bad thing when it comes to spreading this problem? Or is it even an issue with the captive produced frogs? It's not really an issue. The only time, you know, there's any problem that really arises, it's when it's import animals that come from an area where chytrid or ranavirus is known to be. And that's the only real problem. Okay, so so that's not as much an issue with the captive animals, so that's good to hear. I mean, of course, no. you get lots of, uh, sometimes you get, the, I, there's a concern when you get a species that are, you know, cold tolerant that could be released, that were, uh, you know, imported, and then, uh, then getting um, spread to the local populations here. But um, you breed a lot of exotic species that probably wouldn't do as well out here, so it's not as much as a concern, you say. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's start. Yeah, no, most of the stuff I have wouldn't do very well outside. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, of course you keep them everything real warm and and all that. Let's, uh, start talking about how your procedures for you, how you go about producing so many animals. What kind of, well, first of all, what kind of setups do you have and where are all these frogs and tadpoles living Uh, right now? Right now I have a smaller building. It's, uh, eight by, what is it, eight by 24? that I have them in. Um, they're all in 15 quart tubs for the adult Pac-Mans and those guys, I'm working on buying a smaller size greenhouse. I want to do a, uh, flush flow type setup where they're out in the natural light during the day. You know, um, they have a filter system that's hooked up to every tub that, that constantly is cleaning the tub all day long. Um, I don't like keeping them in tanks and stuff like that inside. I really dislike it. Um, the tree frogs I have all set up in, uh, 18 by 18 by 24 exoterras and they're on a mist king system and, uh, it has drains at the bottom. I've drilled drains through the glass and it drains out all the excess water on false bottoms. And so that's where they're at for the moment. When I move to Florida, most of the stuff's going to get greenhouses outside or be in greenhouses. Uh, just, uh, right now I'm kind of at a transitioning phase or I'm kind of stuck at the moment. Right, right. So you're doing what you can with what you have. And yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot different than the warehouse. I used to keep a lot of my stuff in the warehouse, and I had all those five-gallon tanks with the holes drilled at the bottom, and it was just uh, it was a lot of work cleaning out glass tanks. I'm not that great with glass. I tend to break it a lot, so <laughs> yeah. it became a expensive uh, venture. Yeah, plus uh, you have so much stuff. Uh, I mean, eventually you have to work with uh, the practical side of it. I know we... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know we speak with some other lizard breeders and stuff. They just kind of use the bare minimum of what the what, what you can do is not make it too fancy. <laughs> um, now, years ago, yeah. the, the information... Yes. Go ahead. 
Oh, you're cutting out there. Go ahead. Okay. No, I was going to say years ago, the information on uh, breeding frogs in captivity was pretty limited. I mean, even now, uh, mm -hmm. to what uh, people could find in hobbyist magazines, like reptiles magazines and articles or papers and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of those were suggesting to use injections to get breeding going, that sort of thing. How did you educate yourself on how to become so proficient at breeding frogs? I know you mentioned before trial and error. Was there more to it? Yeah, there's a little bit more to it. And, you know, now I've been doing it for several years. It's not that much of a risk for me to show and say how to do it. Um, the, the frogs, you need a large number. I mean, I have about 90 adult pack band frogs. And to be able to con to produce consistently, you have to cycle different groups at different times. Yeah. So you're not, you know, having 45 females with eggs all at one time. Um, the way the way I do it is I put them through, you know, estivation, and they'll sleep for about a month and a half to two months, and it's then kinda, I wake them up. Now that's kind of feed a, them two three times. That's a dormancy period. Yes. Yeah, their their dormancy period. Um, very, very important for the females, the males also. If you skip it for the males, the spawns that they do in the future will not be very fertile. They don't get time to rest. And so what you do is you give them the dormancy period. You feed them a couple times once you wake them up and give them three, four, three, four weeks. And uh, after that's done, what I do is I let them sit in about an inch of water in their tubs and change it every day. And that seems to cycle and get the females to start uh, growing eggs inside them, basically. It gets the follicles to start developing the eggs. And once that's done, then it's just a matter of putting them through the rain chamber and letting time take its uh, course. And you use several males to a female. Um, the one problem that people don't understand is the frogs do not breed like snakes. One male will cover three or four females and snakes. Completely opposite with frogs. Three males will take care of one female. And you just, you need the competition because there are males that, you know, and I have them, they're lazy. They don't want to breed. Um, they'll, they'll do a couple calls and they'll just sit there and you'll be like, ah, I have this female ready to go. And I use this male today and she, he's not wanting to do anything. So it's just a, a numbers game. You have to have a large number of frogs breeding at once. They're community breeders. They breed in pools, lots of frogs. Um, and that's just the easiest way to do it. Right, right. You mentioned the rain chamber. I mean, I see you post pictures of uh, some of the animals in there. You have some grading in there. Talk, tell me about the rain chamber and how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's a simple design. You just uh, any sort of tub that is eh, for Pac-Man frogs at least twelve inches tall. Do a false bottom about three inches so you can get your pump underneath. You just take a PVC pipe and and you run a square square shape over it, drill some holes through it, and uh, have your pump go through a poly hose up into the, the uh, PVC, and that's all there is. It just it will shoot the water through there and rain it back down. And that'll stimulate the activity. Yes. All right. Um, are there any other are are there methods that you vary? I mean, we talked about the Pac-Man frogs. Do you use different methods for different species? Yeah, yeah, different methods for different species. Uh, whites and tomato frogs, they're a little bit more difficult. They take longer to spawn. Um, usually, that's why I don't produce them not that often. They take about a week for to lay. Um, you'll have them in the rain chamber for several days, and they won't do anything. And then finally, you know, you get tired on the last day. You go in there in the morning, and there's eggs everywhere. Um, so I've learned that they take several days. The, the red-eye tree frogs, I have not spawned yet. Um, I just, I haven't had time. I have several groups of adults. I just haven't had time to do them. So I'm not real, uh, uh, experienced with those guys yet. The bird poops to me, they're easy. I just leave them in the tank with the water, water bottom and they lay on their own. They'll breed and lay on their own. And so I've got, uh, 15, 20 tadpoles of those guys right now from a small breeding group. And that's about it for them. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So then you you produce. I mean, you see all these eggs you mentioned. Uh, do you what do you what do you do from there? Mm -hmm. On the pack bands? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you just uh, leave them in the rain chamber. They'll usually develop after being laid. They'll develop between the sixteenth and twentieth hour, 
and they'll start turning into very, very small tadpoles. By the second day, the egg, egg yolk inside of them is all absorbed and they're free swimming. And after that, I usually give them about another day before I move them out of the rain chamber, depending on the water quality, and put them either in the greenhouse or another tub system that I have um, indoors and just go from there, raise them until they're frogs. And how long does that take about? Mm, 30 days to 40. Just depends on the water temperature and how much food they're, they're taking in. So if you, if you raise them up in warmer water, they'll develop quicker then? Yeah, warmer, uh, fast moving, not necessarily fast moving, but fast flowing water. Uh-huh. They seem to grow larger and faster. Oh, okay. And uh, a lot of people ask about diet on tadpole care. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, For the tadpoles, you want to do either a bloodworm diet, blackworm diet. You can use uh, tubafix worms. There is a a tadpole pellet. I don't use it unless I absolutely have to. If I run out of if I run out of worms, the place that supplies me with worms is about ninety five miles away, so I have to drive there about once a week. but they will they will eat when i have a full spawn of 2000 plus tadpoles they'll eat 4 pounds to 6 pounds a day of bloodworms wow <laughs> that's a lot which uh, is which is a lot yeah, which is a lot that's probably why you have to drive to get them you probably get them in great bulk amounts um what oh yeah yeah i'll get 40 to 50 pounds at a time that's really interesting a lot of people ask you know what do you feed the what do you feed the tadpoles? How long does it take? Uh, some people don't have the patience for it. I mean, they just want to get the adults. But it's really interesting that you're offering that to people and uh, that uh, people can learn how to raise up tadpoles. Seems like a simple thing, but um, you don't see a lot of people doing it, I guess. Are they- yeah, there's not, you know, there's not a lot of people um, producing frogs anymore, it seems. Yeah, as like I said, a lot of the secrets of, I mean, people were doing injections before. Do you still do any of that? Does anybody do that still? Um, they're still done. Most of the frog producers do do them, but it just depends. It's usually a timed timed deal. Yeah. So all the injection is is basically releasing a hormone into the animal that is already naturally occurring. So say the hormone level is at zero, for example, and it takes a hormone level of five to produce eggs. So the injection basically gives you that boost up to that five. Um, it's not something that easy. It's definitely not scary. Um, it's a very, very secretive thing. And there's nothing to the actual animal. It does not cause any harm, anything like that, if you know how to do it correctly. Um, that's why it's one of those that's kept secretly. There is uh, a paper uh, by, I believe it's Vance Protease, and they kind of released a little bit on how to do it with flex. But that's own combination that we use here in the states. But the hormones are only necessary. Stay. We have to. We have a huge show, or you know, there's a wholesaler that needs something August first. So back in June, you would do your breeding, do the injection, and then you, it's more of a time. But you still have to go through the process of dormancy. You know, having the frogs, you know, in correct breeding condition for it to even work. Oh, good. No, that's a lot of uh, interesting information you gave uh, us right now. And, of course, that's kind of the basics of it. There's a lot of nuance and uh, timing, like you said. Mm-hmm. Are, you, are there any species you'd like to work yeah. with that you're, not, that you're not working with right now? Uh, the Megaphories Nasuda and Megaphories of Ceres. I have a small group importing um, here in the next month or so. Also, uh, the yellow spot climbing toads. Those are uh, another Malaysian species that I'd like to have, and that'll probably cap it all until I get, uh, you know, better experience with the other species and not necessarily master them, but become more familiar with how to produce them on a consistent level. Um, and then I'll expand into other species as time goes on. Okay, well, uh, Mike, uh, you're breaking up a little bit, so I'll let you go here in a second. Um, but can people expect to see you at the okay. diff- the different shows this year, or uh, what shows are you planning to attend? 
Um, you know, I'm not 100 sure on the shows yet. Uh, I was supposed to go to Tulare for the Reptile Show, but it looks like I'm not going to have any stock to sell. I've sold out. Um, there's a couple bird shows that I'm going to be attending. There's one in San Bernardino this weekend. A another exotic bird show in Las Vegas next weekend. And then after that, it's it's kind of up in the air. Um, I'm not sure. I know the Sacramento show I'll be at for the reptiles. Um, what else? I'm going to try and do Conroe, Texas again this year. Um, Sean, Sean Gray does a great job with that show out there, so I'd like to get back out to that show. It's real, it's real fun out there in Texas. Oh, um, what else? Maybe a Daytona show if I have anything available in August again. We'll see. I usually sell out by then, but I'm going to try and do a handful of shows this year that I haven't done before. Tinley, I'd like to do Tinley for the first time. That would be a good show to go to. It, it just all depends what I have. No, that's great. So people can look for you at those shows. Mike's Fat Frogs. Mike, I know you're a busy guy. I appreciate you t- taking some time to talk with me and teach us about breeding frogs. I look forward to seeing you around. No problem. I wish you the best. Keep those frogs coming. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Mike. You have a good thanks day. Thanks for having me. You too. Bye. That was Mike Matson of Mike's Fat Frogs. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, go to his website, mikesfatfrogs.weebly.com. That's fat, spelled P-H-A-T, mikesfatfrogs.weebly.com. Um, also find him on Facebook. Uh, that was a fun interview. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, February 17th, watch for my interview with Brandy Blue, wildlife educator. She uh, went from aerospace engineering to following her dreams of uh, working with uh, animals. Uh, it's a cool story. She talks to me about what it's like doing public wildlife education. So make sure you catch that. If you're listening to this show after that date, just click on my video uh, on my YouTube channel and you can watch it right now. Otherwise, you have to wait till tomorrow. Go and subscribe to Edgar Ortega, one word, on YouTube.com. So you catch all my interviews as they're uploaded. Follow me on the uh, Edgar Ortega Radio Show page on Facebook. And be sure to enter in the contest we have going on, sponsored by Ken the Bug Guy, where you can win some super rare tarantulas, communal ones, so you can keep three together. Um, That's it for now. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Uh, This has been the Edgar Ortega Radio Show.